So I think we should continue and, and try to recover some time to complete our picture. Now we will have a panel on two organizations, the BRICS and IPSA, where both India, or, or the three countries, China, uh, what, two of the countries, India, no, it's complicated. In IPSA, <laughs> two, two of the countries, India and Brazil are members, in BRICS, all three countries are members. I will briefly introduce the, 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 the panelists. Uh, there on my left side is Ana Flavia Grancia e Barros. She holds a PhD from the Sorbonne in, in Paris, and she, she's now a professor for international relations at the University of Brasilia. Then to my right side is Haibin Yu. He was introduced last time, <laughs> so we can spare some time. And more to the right is Apichan Ray. I hope I pronounced it right. When you see his photos here, he's, he's the, real, the same guy. <laughs> he changed a little bit his outlook. And it's quite interesting. He, he was trained as a mathematical physicist in, and then changed to economics and foreign policy. So we, we start with your presentation, please. Thank you so much for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very tall, so sorry. Um, thank you, Paolo, for the honor of being here. It's really lovely to be in Rio, Canato, um, the cliff. No, thank you so much. And all the friends I met, my new friends. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I'm. Um, my framework is totally different from what we've been doing, uh, I think, in, so in this, to a certain extent. So I um, apologize for that. I'm trying to give new, a new framework more uh, based on what's happening recently. And um, as was Ambassador um, Han mentioned um, yesterday, we have Donald Trump running for the US presidency. We have Brexit, we have the Brazilian crisis, we have lots of things going on. We are in the 21st century since uh, two or three decades, in my view. Um, so uh, my work's more based on uh, lots of IR scholars and other thinkers. Um, I'll mention only one, Paracana, with his book Connectography, because he mm -hmm. proposed that uh, we have to connect, we have to think about connectivity, we have to think out of the box. And I don't agree with everything he says, but I think he's uh, kind of um, ambitious in his thinking, and so I think it's his, um, somehow very inspiring for us here today. Uh, one thing that is most interesting is that um, he makes me think of stakeholders more than states, multinational companies, or people, stakeholders, who are the stakeholders, how are they connecting? That's, I think, a good question for us here today. Um, uh, he also says that, that ecosystems are like infrastructure, land is a um, strategic resource. Um, we are in a global society and we have to look at global supply chains, and I think he's right, we have to think of meat, um, this huge agreements like the TTIP, TTP, uh, Brazil is excluded from it, so is China. Um, we have to think of a global network, civilization, does that exist? Are we going for that? Uh, is there a new world order? If yes, how is it? How is it being built? Who is investing um, in this kind of order? And I think the BRICS countries are, so that's why I like him. Uh, other authors will talk about network diplomacy, complex diplomacy, complex regimes, uh, mega multilateralism, and uh, my worry is that we are not going towards a durable, sustainable international framework. So um, we are not changing our behavior, and we should think about that uh, more precisely. Uh, so my question is, is Brazil a, uh, is still in the BRICS and IPSA? And my assessment go um, in a multi-dimensional uh, analysis much more. Uh, I mean, it's so two years work, I'm just going very quickly here, but if you need the articles, if you're interested, they will be published uh, by the beginning of next year. 
so the framework is uh, we went from presidential diplomacy to what I call now zero diplomacy. I know it's very aggressive, but I'll never write that, okay? <laughs> but uh, that's what I really think. Why? Uh, we had great changes in a very short period. Um, we had two presidential impeachments, two Rio summits, so um, lots of uh, domestic instability and at the same time, a very good international uh, participation in global environmental summits. Um, so Brazil is an interesting case in my, not only because I'm Brazilian, because many things go on and change very quickly here, we have to understand, I, do, I mean, try to understand, try, just try. Um, at the same time, we have now a, the Brazilian decline on the world stage in the UN, WTO, regional organizations, um, climate <coughs> talks, Antarctica, and oceans. For example, I could <coughs> mention others. Um, at the same time, Brazil is a promoter of the Global Zero Initiative. Uh, that means total disarmament of nuclear weapons. And Brazil is not a nuclear power. So, um, as I said, it's a complex context. And of course, we are in a deep economic recession. Um, presidential diplomacy, of course, is related to former President Lula, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, who um, did, uh, who had a very uh, important participation in the BRICS and the IPSA processes. Uh, I invite you all to watch the documentary uh, by a young diplomat called Mauricio Costa. It's called Era dos Gigantes. For those who speak Portuguese, it's not in English yet. Um, he interviews lots of uh, ambassadors and former ambassadors and decision makers, Samuel Pierre Guimarães, Marco Aurelio Garcia, uh, Celso Mourinho, of course, and um, he, kind of, he tries to show what this presidential diplomacy was. And I think it's very uh, interesting for all of us. BRICS, so first of all, what's the BRICS? The BRICS um, was initiated um, from the Russian diplomat, Minister Lavrov, um, the first talk to Brazil, according to Celso Mourinho, and then talk to the other members. And of course, China invited South Africa, and we didn't say anything, but we are not really, we did not agree with that in the beginning. Um, they are emerging powers, but they're also strange bedfellows, inspired <coughs> on Shakespeare's work and what one diplomat said, and then all the other diplomats repeated it, so I don't know where this came from. It's from Shakespeare. Uh, what does it mean? Mean that um, they are together but they are very different in profile, national interest, um, economic profile, and all that, in a multidimensional way. Of course, we all know this. That's why we thought that the BRICS would not last, and we were wrong. Uh, I believe there's a very strong Chinese leadership for this group, and that's why it works. And better than that, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping are very close and they have strong interest in making this BRICS work and stay um, stable and expand. And that's how I interpret the BRICS. So Brazil and India are just more like followers of the BRICS. At least I, want, I will not talk about India because I'm not a specialist. You asked the question to Abby or the ambassador. This is Vaya Matan. Um, sorry for the pronunciation, I tried. Um, the fuzzy question was, will the BRICS survive? We always ask this question. And I think this, uh, it's not a good question. It will survive. The question is, how skillful are negotiators to find common agendas? And I'll try to show you that those uh, common agendas exist, and uh, the new issues are infrastructure, energy security, transition to a low carbon economy, and innovation, and other issues that were discussed here. Why infrastructure? Very easy. Uh, the Chinese are very strong. The, India, the Indian companies also, they have um, lots of services to propose. Latin America and Brazil need infrastructure. We all know that. So, common interest. Energy security, obvious. I don't think I have to explain, and transition to a low-carbon economy, uh, that's where 
all those BRICS members need to work together because they can share experience, they can learn, they can sell, they can produce. It's a big green economy market there. So uh, I think the BRICS are very, um, they have a bright future if those agendas are developed. Um, the principles of the BRICS, uh, in my view, from political, from international relations uh, uh, interpretation, they don't mean anything. It's just diplomatic discourse. The principles are um, openness, solidarity, equality, mutual understanding, inclusiveness, and mutually beneficial cooperation. It doesn't mean anything. And it is just rhetoric. So don't follow those kind of discourses. Uh, and I think they don't help so much to understand what the BRICS is. <coughs> um, this is from the University of Toronto. Uh, and then the BRICS agenda. Um, from the security point of view, they only talk about very broad issues, like they will, uh, they are starting to talk about terrorism, for example, but they don't talk about uh, the UN Security Council reforming, and it didn't have an impact because there was no consensus, of course, a nuclear disarmament, it's not, just not going to happen. Um, the UN reform, in my view, failed. They don't talk about it anymore because um, the BRICS and especially China have had a second option and that was let's build our own institutions, our banks. That's why the banks are in Asia. Um, the climate regime, climate talks still go on, but I think they are fading away. They are less important in the agenda. They just talk because it's an energy issue and then it's interesting to keep the climate talks on the agenda, of course. But it's not to save the planet. It's how do we respond to this complex of regime, a regime complex. Um, and key issues, infrastructure, technology, and energy cooperation, as uh, most speakers mentioned already this morning. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you can't see the what this the arrows mean, but um, the blue one is technology. My two topic has you see um, cooperation, energy, and technology. Just to show those are the BRICS summits. I'm sorry, uh, it was bigger, and I did not pay attention to that. But you have uh, when I give you the presentation, if you want, you have the ears and what they mean. So cooperation, climate change, and technology are the um, issues most present in BRICS declarations. This is an article that's not been published yet, but uh, it's a mathematical calculation of uh, functions. Uh, for example, if you put the term multilateralism, uh, what do you get as a result? And uh, don't ask me, I'm not a mathematician, but uh, I can put you in touch with the person who works with us if you need explanations. Just to show that the issues are more or less stable, but in the beginning you had more um, preoccupation on uh, sovereignty principles, non uh, injurious from other councils like UN reform, and now you have more uh, connectivity issues, connectivity related issues like technology, uh, cooperation, and information sharing, and all that. Yes, uh, that's what I said. Uh, I can show you this. Uh, So, uh, it's because it's too big and when you say the plane and você coloca o monitor pleno não aparece. So, there you can see um, orange, for example, it's very interesting, it's climate. And you see, it's, uh, as I mentioned, it goes down. It was very important in the beginning and now it's go down. This is uh, the, last, the last summit, okay? Uh, we're waiting for the next summit to finish the article. Um, so, the first one, dark blue, is development. Red, 
cooperation, the green sustainable development, um, and then energy, technology, and climate. Okay? Yeah? Just to, to show that I have a point. Uh, so. so, thank you. So, about the IFSA. IFSA, on the contrary, um, according to Celso Morin, it was a Brazilian initiative with, with our Indian friends. And it was created, and we usually uh, mention IFSA, we say IBAS, because they say, uh, we say in Brazil that's a Brazilian idea, so it's IBAS in Portuguese, mm -hmm. not in English, okay? Um, and of course, uh, we have a long agenda of common interests with India, social development, uh, hunger, poverty, illiteracy, and um, so IPSA was always considered by former President Lula much more legitimate, much more interesting for Brazil, much easier to negotiate. But uh, this right to development agenda is not a Brazilian idea. It's, uh, of course, much older and belongs to the southern countries in general. And uh, Brasilia, uh, in my opinion, always made an effort to keep China away from that. And I think that um, China tried um, some point in history, recent history, to put the two groups together. Why can't we make one group out of two? Because they are most the same countries. And Brazil uh, always said, we no, we don't want. Those are completely different agendas. It's a political mechanism. Um, I can explain if you need uh, later on. So what's IFSA now? A bunch of good ideas. Uh, but not enough money. Uh, what good ideas? We try to learn with each other. Uh, the Indian government uh, was very uh, well impressed with our uh, Bolsa Escola initiative, Bolsa Familia initiative, uh, vaccination campaigns, uh, and other kinds of services Brazil proposed and models Brazil had. And now Brazil has a very big pro um, program on uh, energy for um, faraway cities. Uh, it's called Luz para Todos. It's one of the biggest in the world. Of course, we say we, it's the biggest, but I'm not sure. It's probably the biggest now, but there's no money, so difficult to measure how big it is. Um, and it's really interesting because it's also a problem for India, how to have people having electricity, in a very effective uh, and cheap way, and also sustainable if possible. Um, so the question for IFSA is, will India and Brazil connect one day? We have so much in common. Why don't we work together, stop talking, and start doing? Um, and I think this is the best question for IFSA. And also, uh, IFSA is almost dead, I think, unfortunately. Um, and then I go back to the BRICS. What does it mean to be the BRICS? Uh, I think we have three different uh, faces. The first one, former President Lula and former Minister Celso Amorim, they had a point. The point was to reform the UN, to reinforce multilateralism, um, to have voice in international intergovernmental organizations, and to challenge the Western liberal order not the U.S., but the order to have a say. Um, and Celso Morin has his uh, framework. The Brazilian brand strategy is there. Active and autonomous diplomacy. Diplomacia ativa e altiva. Uh, of course, well, that's published in all his books and articles. Um, and then we had the second phase, a former president, Dilma Rousseff, Minister Antonio Patriota, eh, former minister Isabel Figueiredo, didn't even put Minister Marco because he spent some short time in power that he didn't really have uh, the chance to do much. Um, although IBSA is more sympathetic, uh, it was like the Brazilian government didn't have time for that. Uh, I don't think they invested what they could on India. Um, on the contrary, the South South Cooperation had a very negative impact 
most projects were suspended and cancelled or they didn't have the money to keep the timetable um, going. So in my view, that's the end of the active and autonomous diplomacy. That's the end, the beginning of the end of diplomacy. That's the second, the third phase when Minister Mauro just uh, was in power and then um, it was, there was the impeachment and Temer was named president and uh, Joseph Serra is his foreign minister. Uh, I say zero diplomacy because uh, just to provoke you, I think it's a real disaster now for our diplomacy. Uh, I'm really sorry about that for people who really work. Um, there's no strategy at all, uh, apart from talking to potential investors, and those investors are China in the first place, the United States, and where money can come. And I'm, I'm, I think it's a very difficult time for Brazil, and most of our principles and values are forgotten. Um, and it's, it's very easy, I think, to find out zero diplomacy. Just listen to what President Temer said in the UN General Assembly. Nonsense. It's terrible. It's terrible. I'm very, no, don't listen. I, I'm ashamed of it, so no, don't listen. Uh, but it's zero diplomacy. So uh, does BRIC have a meaning? Uh, yes, it does. But uh, this meaning is because Brazil is heavily dependent on Chinese investments. Of course, we all agree, I think. Um, no, okay. And Brazil abandoned uh, the responsibility while protecting uh, the sustainable peace uh, argument in the UN, um, where Brazil could play a role, because sustainable peace also means um, food security, human rights, uh, peaceful negotiations with neighbors, for example, um, climate activism. I would not say Brazil was a big activist on climate talks, but it was somehow an important actor, mm -hmm. and now it's no longer the case. And UN reform in general, Brazil just doesn't exist anymore, in my view. So, what does that show us? Um, if you look at the political decision-making processes, I th and you look at it as a chain, I think there's two chains broken. Uh, the first one is between, uh, in, in Brasilia, between the Casa Civil, the presidential cabinet, and the Itamaraty. Um, they are not talking. They don't, I mean, the diplomats say that nobody listens. And this is a real problem for Brazil now because uh, how will they, can they assess how important BRICS is if they don't listen? It's not José Serra who's going to assess that all uh, alone. And the second um, chain is between Itamaraty and key ambassadors um, in Geneva, Washington, New York, uh, Beijing, Delhi, and in some specific issues, the ambassadors are still doing their job the best they can, but they are not necessarily linked to Brasilia. And that's, that exists in all countries. In Brazil, <coughs> we had some kind of autonomy. This, uh, this happens, it's normal, but now it's becoming serious in my point of view. So uh, my final remarks is that Brazil does not have a grand strategy cannot be compared to China or to India. Um, regional governance is not an option for a Brazilian insertion in the global uh, value chains. Um, BRICS does not mean much for bilateral cooperation, in my view. It doesn't. Uh, even the FIFSA means even less. Of course, they meet, they know each other, and they have the agendas, but it doesn't have the leverage power we thought it would have. Uh, and many examples were mentioned today, innovation, technology, education, um, services in general. They are completely different negotiating agendas, unfortunately. And finally, uh, Brazil is participating in these ini initiatives by inertia until next presidential election, elections. I mean, uh, there's no grand strategy, just trying to respond, being very reactive. 
Uh, and in fact, I think we have no choice because uh, the diplomats don't have the power to impose a deal as they had in the past. I mean, 10 years ago, diplomats were really strong and they had a deal and they had their traditions and their principles and uh, they were kind of um, completely um, apart from society. P uh, foreign policy was not for public opinion. It was mm -hmm. for, for professionals, for experts. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see that now we don't have public opinion and we don't have congressmen and we don't have experts or diplomats. That's why we have no choice. So sorry for this pessimistic <laughs> view. <laughs> <laughs> of course, my friends will be much more optimistic. And if you, if you have questions, you can ask Paulo. I think he's uh, better than me to explain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, hopefully we will we'll get some more optimistic view from China to balance our. <laughs> Não, mas eu acho que não foi golpe. A gente pode brigar. Eu acho que tinha que ter um golpe. Que é? Que é? Ah, eu vi. Good morning, once again. I'm, I'm sorry I will speak again because uh, my, my Chinese colleague uh, uh, cannot uh, come here this time. Um, but uh, I'd like to share some uh, uh, observation of the Chinese uh, strategy towards the uh, BRICS <coughs> cooperation. I think the first uh, I will talk about China's um, um, view on the inter future international order. Um, I think put the BRICS cooperation within this kind of uh, world view. Uh, what is the existing order? I think one is uh, uh, Pax Americana. Uh, this is uh, the US dominated uh, uh, world order. It, contain, it contains three pillars. It's American or Western values, the US led military alignment, uh, alignment and the UN and its institutions. Uh, within this, um, this order, I think China is uh, never fully embraced uh, to this other system. Uh, despite its uh, tremendous progress within this order, China has long been, um, I think, uh, it's isolated politically by the Western world. And also the US-led military alliance put their interests above others and uh, pays little attention to China's security concerns. So in this meaning, I, I think um, it's, this, is, uh, this is not the order China prefer. So but at the same time, there's another order. Uh, <coughs> this is the UN-led international order. I think this order refers to uh, is the UN and its institutions focus on this aspect of the, of the US dominated order, including the principles of the international laws. This may uh, overlap with uh, uh, just the uh, mentioned the American uh, dominated order, but it is not exactly the same. In this order, China has a strong sense of belonging uh, because as a founding member of the, uh, this order. And also, China identify itself as a beneficiary and a contributor, as well as a part of the reformer to this order. I think this order offers uh, more space, not only to the established powers, but also emerging powers. Uh, there are some uh, shortcomings of the Western-dominated order. Uh, it cannot offer solutions to global uh, challenges 
So we say the G20 now, so we have involved, invited a more emerging powers into it. And the American dominated military allies put its security interest on others. Um, I think this um, created some uh, disputes and disorder around the globe, uh, like the Middle East, uh, like Central Asia, the East Asia. Um, because it doesn't respect the power shifting and the, re and, and the local conditions. And it's difficult for the Western dominated order to adapt them itself to the rise of powers with the different uh, civilizations, political systems, and institutions. Because they don't worry, they are not only worry about the rising of the material power, but they are, uh, they are also worrying about the success, successful stories in different uh, culture, different systems. So. Um, now I move to the my, my personal understanding of President Xi's international thoughts. Um, I think uh, he initiated a lot of uh, initiatives, uh, like the One Belt, One Road, uh, the AID, uh, these things, and also some new concepts, like the new type of relations of the great powers, uh, great countries being translated. Between U.S. and China, U.S. Uh, China and uh, Russia, and also the new concept of the security, common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable. Uh, this is some similar like the Brazilian idea, um, uh, development peace. This kind of sustainable peace, mm -hmm. uh, peace based on the development. This kind of ideas um, in the context of the Asia. Um, Affairs should be charged by Asians. These kind of ideas. I think it's a local solution, local to the to the global challenge. These kind of ideas. Um, and uh, he emphasizes the best option to solve flashpoints is dialogue and negotiation. Um, you can see today in the South China Sea, they are still uh, trying to negotiate to the relative uh, countries. Um, bilaterally. And the co coordination among great powers is the key to solve the important issues. This is a kind of, kind of ideal European uh, concept of great powers. Um, that, that means great, great powers should uh, take the great responsibility. And also he emphasizes the important role of global governance Guiding China's national interest. Um, he invited two professor, Chinese professors to give, le give less, uh, classes to the uh, top leaders uh, on, the, on economic uh, global governance. Um, so I think um, China shows a good progressive and cooperative uh, approach in dealing with the global challenges. But also his approach to Safeguard the national interest is, is more proactive now um, and uh, realistic by building the military power, uh, enhancing the international agenda uh, fighting power. Uh, I think the military power is not to, to provoke war, but to prevent war from happening. I suppose this is kind of idea. So uh, within this background, uh, we talk about the breaks in uh, China's international strategy. Um, uh, just as Professor Anna mentioned, that the BRICS is the idea of the Russia and the Brazil. At the very beginning, China is very reluctant to join this, this group. But later on, uh, China realized the, the importance of this, um, this group, but want to make it more globalized. Uh, so invite South Africa, the most powerful country from Africa, to join this club. And uh, now, it's a lot of challenges now. But um, let me focus on what, what China think about this uh, BRICS. Um, the BRICS shows that China is not uh, rising alone. And uh, the BRICS represents a broad shift in the global balance of power to emerging countries, uh, emerging economies. And it, 
And also it's easier for China to promote the reform of the international system and reshape uh, the key international institutions as a member of the BRICS uh, with the grouping negotiation capacity. Because the rise of India and the Brazil cause less attention from the Western world, uh, this may uh, reduce uh, Chinese pressure. And BRICS relationship with the Western order, I think this is a, um, a key point to understand why they stand together, uh, because all BRICS members aren't uh, Western powers. All members were excluded by the new round uh, economic rules um, like TPP, TTIP. And China expected uh, to play an equal role without leading or dominating the agenda setting of the BRICS by the members of the group. This is a key point. Equal role, not leading role, not, not dominating role. Um, so this is why China created AIIB besides NDC. Because it's just an equal footing, China can contribute less resources to this institution. Then its international influence will be minimized uh, based on the standard of South Africa's capacity. Uh, so this is a key challenge for this institution. What is AIIB? As Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, and the feature or dilemma of China as a global player. So let me quote uh, uh, some words from my former president of the, our institute, Yang, Professor Yuan Jianlian. He mentioned the model of the new type of great power relations is Sino-Russia relations. Its emphasis is Sino-US relations. Its growing <coughs> point is Sino-BRICS relations. Its focal point is Sino-Europe relations. And it's difficult is Sino-Japan relations. <laughs> so <laughs> you see China faces a very complex uh, picture in the, uh, in the global context. Uh, so BRICS, uh, it's difficult to identify its position in China's global strategy. So what is the future of the BRICS cooperation? Uh, I think the tension is still there and it's growing despite the emerging pessimistic views based on the poor economic performance of Brazil and Russia in recent years. Uh, so I saw that the change of the leadership in, in, in Brazil didn't change the commitment to this uh, uh, cooperation. And also the BRICS countries are still the major emerging economies with um, huge potential to be innovative and leading in terms of the new development roles, huge market, international role, low, low carbon economy, innovation, etc. cetera. Um, I raised this point because um, <coughs> as emerging powers or emerging economies, they have uh, the rights to, to choose, uh, to be flexible or creative, to choose the future role. Um, and also, uh, they, they, they have the influence um, for the rest of the developing world uh, to follow because uh, the liberal model has, has met some problems in Middle East, in Africa, in, in, in Latin America. So these leading emerging economies should be more uh, innovative. And the institutionalized cooperation such as NDC and CRA and uh, uh, closer economic ties among BRICS members are positive things from China's perspective since it shows that the countries with different political system and development levels can cooperate. Uh, Brazil is the largest trade partner of China. We are doing effort to improve our economic ties with our great neighbors, Russia and uh, India. I hope we can, we can do more in this regard. So given the exclusive nature of the current world order, BRICS members still need to stand together to achieve their international ambitions. Um, if the US uh, led international order are not open um, to, the, to be inclusive to the emerging powers, they, they still need to stand together. Uh, <coughs> building a strategic trust among China, India, and Russia is key for the future BRICS in dealing with Asian and world affairs. 
uh, when yesterday um, Leonard showed the map of the one, one belt, one road, our Indian friend writes a question about that. And uh, the one belt, one road was caused a lot of attention, strategic attention from India and Russia about their, their <coughs> regional um, cooperation project. Uh, but, but I think um, these three countries should work together um, to, um, to make their uh, res respective uh, international in initiatives uh, accommodate, from, accommodate each other and then to create more opportunities for themselves and for the, for the region. So BRICS uh, shall stand together and avoid to be divided on political and value systems. Uh, so this is point to come to the Ibsa, because it's ex exactly based on the political and value shared this kind of ideas. Um, but um, it lacks the capacity and also you can say even the US or the G7, they are promoting the democracy abroad. It's, it's, it's not, it's not a, the achievements are not very uh, recognized. So that less, less not to say Ibusa. So I guess Ibusa should be integrated into the BRICS agenda. Uh, even though uh, analysis from the US uh, that John Attenberry is predicting the rise of the group of new democracies such as Brazil and India would grow into the nat natural allies for the United States, but I'm not sure whether they can be the natural allies for the U.S. Depends on the U.S. definition of the international system. And others, others such as uh, Ms. Uh, Manuel, uh, the former White House of the uh, senior officials warned, warned that the prospect of alliance between the U.S. and India to contain China is too dangerous uh, for, for the U.S. and for the world order. So I think the BRICS members should have a big picture in mind. And will, will the Western powers join the NDB later as they <coughs> did in the case of AIIB? Uh, I'm not sure because the NDB is structured based on equal sovereignty and uh, fix the shareholding of the founding members to minimize its capacity and attractiveness for others. So the current uh, task for the BRICS uh, US Development Bank, I guess, is to attract <coughs> more uh, members um, from the emerging powers, emerging economies. So the new, uh, newfound interest of the BRICS is to expand its, its agenda to security beyond the economic affairs, especially in recent summits uh, from Russia to India. They put a lot of security interests into the agenda. Um, this is a hard, um, hard, hard issue for, for build cooperation. Um, I hope they can have some um, coordinate their definitions about the security issue uh, and also to create some common approach to deal with them. So thank you very much. Okay, we saved some time and yeah. continue now. <laughs> So uh, my gratitude to the organizers, uh, Giga, FGV, UC Rio, uh, for inviting me. Um, and I also thank, want to especially thank my fellow speakers today as well as yesterday for a very interesting discussion. Now, I also realize that I'm the last speaker of the conference unless there is some changes in plan. So I will use this as an excuse to take a very theoretical and perhaps an abstract view of BRICS and how it can be explained within international organizations theory. So it would be a little bit of a, um, perhaps a different view on BRICS. The first question I want to address is this, what is BRICS, right? So it's not a political coalition. It's not a trading bloc. So we attempted to define BRICS uh, in an earlier work <coughs> last year. We said, well, you can define BRICS as a geoeconomic alliance that perceives power concentration in the hands of Bretton Woods institutions as unfair and seeks to promote alternative models of development 
through the sheer weight of the collective to create policy space. That was one, one definition that we advanced, but we quickly realized that this definition is still lacking. Why is it lacking? Because, first of all, you cannot use this to compare BRICS and other formal or informal uh, international governance institutions or initiatives. And this definition is also very ethnocentric in the sense that it ignores the tangible or potentially the tangible geopolitical role of BRICS. So clearly what we need is we need new definition of BRICS. So what is it? So I propose that BRICS is a multiplicities of regimes. Now regimes in the sense of uh, regime theory, I'll get into that, which does the following things. It promotes context specific developmental goals, both within the member states and the international system at large. Two, it seeks to redress perceived unfairness intrinsic to the extant global political and economic governance architectures. And three, acts as a self-help group in an anarchic and uncertain international system. So the self-help group, this terminology is borrowed from uh, Kenneth Waltz. But if BRICS is a multiplicity of regimes, uh, what are the two meta, what are the meta principles that organize this, uh, these regimes? Because regimes ultimately are organized according to some, some framing, some uh, meta principles. So I propose that there are two meta principles that organize the uh, BRICS regimes. One is that of sovereign preponderance, which would be the subject of my talk, uh, and that of democratic equity. Um, and I would argue that these principles absorb and reflect the shape of the contemporary global order. And once you take these principles as a theoretical starting point, you can test them empirically to BRICS states' behavior. Right? So that would be the goal. But coming back to this issue of regimes, uh, I said the BRICS uh, could be viewed as a multiplicity of regimes. So, so then we have to fit BRICS behavior in terms of the classic definition of international regimes. So what is it? So regimes, as you know, defined by Robert Quijon in his uh, classic definition, are sets of implicit or explicit principles, norms, rules, and decision-making procedures around which actor expectations converge. So it's a very rationalist uh, definition. Uh, now, Krasner, uh, Stephen Krasner, has a slightly different view. As you know, he would say that well, regimes are essentially intervening variables between basic causal factors like power and interest and outcomes and behavior. So they're sort of an intermedi uh, intervening variables. But both Gihon's definition and Krasner's explication would need passing in the context of BRICS. So first of all, who are the actors in BRICS? Let's sort of do this one by one. Well. They're both A, the five individual countries, and B, which is maybe a little bit more controversial, I would claim that they often have acted as a unitary actor in the international system whenever expectations have converged within the five countries. And in the latter case, as, as a unitary actor, BRICS is between like-minded uh, uh, like economy states. After all, the idea of BRICS is that BRICS in some sense becomes a guiding light for other emerging econ economies, uh, uh, economy states, right? Now, what are the areas of convergence? Because that's the other part of, of the definition that I gave you uh, for uh, Kihon's, uh, Kihon's definition. So the areas of convergence for BRICS states have been so far, uh, the necessity of reforms of multilateral institutions, advocacy of a fully multilateral trading system, concern about potentially destabilizing effects of hot capital inflow, and finally, the concerns about unilateral use of force in conflict situations such as in Iraq, Libya, and Syria. What are the principles and norms? Well, the principles and norms BRICS, BRICS have advocated have been shaped by, I would claim, the essentially unequal character of the Western created and led geopolitical and geoeconomic architecture. BRICS decision-making rules and procedures, that's the other part of the definition, are democratic in the sense of one state, one vote, and that, that gets reflected in how, for example, the NDB is, is uh, structured, the New Development Bank. The basic causal factor of power is the collective uh, economic weight of the grouping. Which I remind you with the GDP, the, the sum of the GDP of the BRICS states is roughly equal to the nominal GDP of the United States, a little bit less, I think. Uh, and the basic causal factor of interest, though this is, this is different, this difference from member states to member states, because different member states see BRICS doing different things even when there, there's ex, uh, convergence of expectations. So just to sort of link this to India, India, for example, sees BRICS as pivotal in enabling broad-based support for being part of the global community as a rule maker. 
for India, BRICS is just a platform by which we go from agenda taking to agenda making. That, that's our, our interest in BRICS. Now, international regimes, at least from the rationalist perspective, are, arise because of two main factors, right? A lack of authoritative and binding institutions, and when the world order is uh, marked by pervasive uncertainty, right? the obvious aside that there is no unitary world government in charge of all governance issues, the question of authority, as moral philosophers have long argued, is integrally linked with that of legitimacy, which then in, in turn is linked to the notion of equity, or the need for equity. Now from voting shares in the IMF, to the lack of a global monetary policy regime, which essentially reduces, I mean the lack of a global monetary policy regime is an immediate consequence, which is that essentially the value of currencies are a function of emerging economies and LDCs are a function of US federal interest rate. Which we saw last year when the Fed raised uh, the policy rate in December. I mean, our currencies were doing strange. At least in India, the currencies were doing strange things. Um, to uh, promoting shares, lack of global monetary policy regime, to quasi unilateral use of force in the garb of uh, responsibility to protect. BRICS states are unified, I think, in their varying degree of dissatisfaction with the extent or larger. The level of dissatisfaction differs. Now the fact that the world order circa 2016 is characterized by uncertainty is self-evident. I mean, people have talked about it in the seminar. Uh, Brexit, um, uh, uh, well, it hasn't happened, right? I mean, we're moving towards Brexit, is what I would say. But as and when Brexit happens, when the UK uh, goes ahead with Article 50, invocation of the EU, we will see long-term disruption to global markets, both financial and real. So, for example, to buffer against such uncertainty, you have BRICS arrangements, right? And that's called the CRA, the Contingent Reserve Arrangement. And I'm happy to inform you that the Indian uh, Foreign Minister, or, uh, Finance Minister, Arun Jaitley, just announced yesterday that CRA is now operationalized. So this is going to be, uh, so it's no longer, it's yet one more thing that's now, now in business. Coming back to these two principles that I was, two meta principles that I was saying, uh, organizes uh, BRICS regime, uh, principle of sovereign preponderance, right? Um, what is it? This principle basically states a very simple thing. It states that the state, for well, the BRICS member states, is primary in an inviolable unit in the international system. The state's imperatives override all other concerns in the international agenda, and that intrastate cooperation is possible insofar as such cooperation leads to greater and not lesser state agency. And then this state agency, this greater state agency, is channeled to developmental needs of each of the states. So the state, in other words, is the only agent that mediates the domestic concerns and the international atmosphere. Right? Now, you would say, okay, look, this formulation is obvious in some sense, because this is what the 80, uh, what 1648 uh, Treaty of Westphalia was supposed to have stated, right? But beyond the obvious nature of the statement, uh, I would argue that the BRICS states have derived some very specific consequences from this principle. And then these, these consequences have gone on to promote the norms, the, the BRICS norms, or the BRICS regimes. Right? Now, what are these consequences? The consequences pertain to the complicated relationship between all five BRICS states that they have with globalization, with capitalism, with the role of sovereignty in interstate relationships, as well as to their commitment to multi-alignment and autonomy in the strategic space. In particular, the principle of sovereign preponderance has three immediate and actionable corollaries. One, states can intervene in domestic markets as and when they see fit. This is the resurgence of state capitalism. Two, states in the absence of international monetary policy coordination can intervene in global currency markets in defense of their national currencies. And three, states must pursue foreign policies of multi-alignment with other powers, often on a contingent basis. These are three immediate corollaries that follow. So to, to delve into these corollaries a little bit and test it with empirical evidence. The international order post the unipolar moment can be characterized as post-Westphalian, due to essentially two main reasons. One was the contagi contagious spread of Western-led globalization, one form of globalization, as opposed to deglobalization. And two, the reemergence of the strategic philosophy of preemption, which you colloquially call the Bush Doctrine. 
Now, globalization and promoting rapid capital in and out growth presents a key challenge to emerging economies. And I think we're all on board or, or, or on the same boat when it comes to this one. Because while these economies cannot insulate themselves, because how can an economy insulate itself? Because we already know that economic openness leads to greater national uh, welfare gains, right? The ebb and flow of global finance capital cannot be managed by individual states, especially in the absence of international policy coordination, right? So the vagaries of global finance capital have often translated to shocks to emerging economies and has impinged on sovereignty, economic sovereignty, I would argue. Coming to the political side, the Bush Doctrine severely undermined the case for national sovereignty, as is well known, beginning with the disastrous decision to invade Iraq in 2003. And, and, and Hungarian scholar very nicely say, uh, wrote this down, and I quote, the philosophy of preventive slash preemptive actions, although controversial, suggests the need to conceptualize again classical sovereignty defined according to Westphalian coordinates. So, sovereignty is a contested notion, subject to changing interpretations that alter the environment in which states relate to. So, by, so this is the sort of the loosening of the norm of sovereignty, if you wish, that happened because of the, the philosophy of uh, preemption of the Bush Doctrine. Now, by converging on the principle of sovereign preponderance, I would argue, BRICS seeks to restore classical Westphalian sovereignty as an ordering principle in the international system, both in the strategic as well as the economic sphere. To, to each his own remains a key point of convergence between BRICS states. And for example, speaking at the FIC uh, BRICS summit in Durban in 2013, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping asked the world to respect the right of all countries to independently choose their social systems um, and development paths and diversity of civilizations, and that the internal affairs of a country should be handled by its own people. So it's an assertion of that principle of, of uh, sovereign preponderance. Now coming to the normative consequences of this principle, right? BRICS states have often been observed or accused of to have practiced greater state intervention in the respective economies. And I don't think we can deny that, that uh, BRICS states to varying degrees have meddled in their economies, good or bad, I mean, that's a separate story. Now as the latest uh, government of India, for example, budget shows, the Indian state is far from retreating from an active role in managing the Indian economy. And I mean, I'll give you just one example, our allocations to state or uh, state employment guarantee schemes, for example, in the rural sector, has grown or has remained constant. And this is from Prime Minister Modi, who's supposed to be probably one of the most uh, free market uh, prime ministers we have ever had. So states are important for their economies. The Chinese stance on state capitalism on the sea is even more pronounced. Just to give you an example, a leaked uh, CPC memorandum in 2014, it's the so-called Document 9, explicitly barred party members from extolling the virtues of neoliberal economics, right? So in Brazil, I think there has been broad-based popular support for state intervention in the Brazilian economy, which have acted as incentives for Brazilian politicians to do the same, I'm afraid. Under Vladimir Putin, Russia has aggressively increased state control of its economy, the Russian defense minister, for example, a staunch supporter of Mr. Putin, bluntly declared that Russian natural resources belong, and I quote, belong to the state, they're not private property. This was Putin's foreign minister. In South Africa, under Jacob Zuma, the state would go on to announce that the state will have much higher stakes in resource companies and would steeply tax those that do not allow state ownership. Clearly, all five countries are on board in terms of greater state intervention. Brazil, Russia, India, and China have also to varying extent intervened in the international currency markets or at least have threatened to do so to boost their export competitiveness, right? And or to value and or the value of their national economies, right? Just give you a couple of examples. The context, well, before the example, the context of this monetary interventionism is reactive in the sense that it stems from the unconventional monetary policy adopted by the United States post the global financial crisis, which is the policy of quantitative easing in particular, it also stems from unilateral shifts in monetary policy by US Federal Reserve, like introducing policy rates that I just alluded to, which have acted to prop up the American dollar at the expense of other currencies. Brazil, China, and India have controlled their capital accounts to discourage speculative flow of capital, right? I mean, this is, uh, and 
when would you see much more speculative flow of capital? When you'd see when policy rates are, for example, tinkered with. Uh, again, I referred to you what, what was likely to have happened in December 2016 when the US saw first rate hike in, in many years of any kind. Brazil's finance minister justified his country's leash on the capital account as a reaction to US monetary policy and what he termed as the potential of currency wars in the environment post the global financial crisis. China's interventionism in the uh, currency market by devaluing the yuan to boost export competitiveness is well known to the point that it can be passed without a comment. In light of the US policy rate increase uh, uh, last year, so this December 2015, 2016, this year, yeah, the Reserve Bank of India openly said, look, we'll intervene in the currency markets uh, uh, to keep the rupee from free falling. The principle of sovereign preponderance, now moving to the, uh, from the economic side to the political side, also has had significant consequence for foreign policies of BRIC states, making them exhibit a preference for a multipolar international system when they engage with different poles on a case-by-case -case basis and where they themselves are view, view themselves as poles, at least regionally, right? So this is the so-called multi-alignment model. The gist of this argument, why sovereign preponderance would imply a preference for this multi-alignment system is this. A multipolar arrangement necessarily entails a diffusion of power. That's the definition of, of a multipolar arrangement. Now, in such an arrangement, states can engage with different poles in an issue-based way. Now, given that there's a multiplicity of poles, none of the poles themselves are powerful enough to dominate the international agenda, right? So in this way, the, in, the engagement with multiple poles entail lesser trade-offs with sovereignty than a bipolar uh, in system work where engagement takes a binary, take it, give it, either or form. Right? So this, for example, is the implicit logic behind India's posture of strategic autonomy uh, underwritten by the multipolar architecture. Coming to the Chinese foreign policy. Chinese foreign policy in the Xi Jinping has also shown a marked preference for a multipolar odd world where it converges with, uh, with the other two great powers, Russia and the United States, whenever there's a convergence of interest. So there has been a convergence of interest. And a multipolar balance of power arrangement in the international uh, agenda making space guarantees for the Chinese that none of the other powers would promote norms that the Chinese see as running counter to China's notion of sovereignty, strong notion of sovereignty. On the other hand, China would be reluctant to create a bipolar system. Uh, in the future with itself as a pole, and presumably with the United States as the other pole, since that would entail significant global governance responsibilities, which they have traditionally eschewed. The Chinese have traditionally shied away from bearing all global governance responsibilities. So they, in some sense, would prefer a multipolar world as opposed to being one of the two poles and them having to bear a lot of the brunt. Um, Come to Russia. Russia views multipolarity as a precondition to preventing norms such as responsibility to protect from being prevalent. The Kremlin suspects that these norms are instruments to target regime change in life with democratic peace theory and uh, democracy promoting. This is straight away taken from a Russian um, article, so don't blame me for, for what the Russians say. Again, for Russia, multipolarity and uh, multi-alignment guarantees sovereign preponderance, especially as it sees liberal norms, as they would call it, as threats that glorify individual rights over peace and stability. So to sum what I just said in, in my presentation, BRICS, the, I think the best way of, uh, to view BRICS would be either as a multiplicity of regimes or as a regime complex, because these several regimes would interact. This regime complex, uh, in turn, is organized according to two meta principles. One is the meta principle of sovereign preponderance, which I've talked about today, and the other being democratic equity, which to know more about which you'd have to read uh, an upcoming monograph that I'm writing. Um, uh, now the principle of sovereign preponderance is a principle, just to sum, essentially of state trust in the international order or of strong sovereignty postures in the international system. This principle has immediate consequences in terms of uh, behavior of big states and or on areas where actor expectations converge, because after all that would be what regimes do. Thank you. Wow.